Well, good afternoon. I know this is the challenge for any preacher, is after everybody gets full and still, everybody gets sleepy. And so I'm going to do that about every five minutes and uh, wake you back up, I guess. And so uh, thankful again for the introduction. I I have to tell something about Brother Levi right quick. When he was teaching our classes, filling in for Brother Winkler, uh, he was just telling us sometimes how he dealt with church problems. And uh, we knew he was a farmer and a preacher as well. And he said, sometimes, he said, boys, sometimes I get so frustrated with the church. He said, I get out there on my tractor and I mow down the brethren. <laughs> and so if y'all get him frustrated enough, he'll be on the tractor mowing you down. But... Uh, but you know what a kind heart he has. You can't even imagine him doing that. But, but I always have loved this church, love coming here to preach uh, several Wednesday nights over the last several years. Y'all, y'all have always been just a welcoming group of folks, and I appreciate that so very much. It's almost like a home away from home for us. And so we, we're happy to be with you this week and excited about this meeting. I uh, just wanted to tell you about tomorrow night. I hope that you'll invite people to come and be with us. We're going to talk about when storms of life come, because everybody hurts, everybody has trouble, and uh, we need to know how to deal with that. We need to know how to help people uh, in times of sickness or in loss or whatever the case is. Uh, How do we handle that? What does God's Word say about that? So we're going to look at that tomorrow night. Hope that you'll invite somebody to be with you. Uh, Also, I want to just tell you this. For the rest of the week, today included, um, I just have this policy because it's to me, one of the best ways to go about it. You can invite anybody that you want to come and be with you, whether they go to another type of church, whatever the case is, because I'm not going to name any church names in any disparaging way from this pulpit. And I'm going to make it to where we can bring anybody we want to here to hear the gospel, hear God's word, and not shut any doors. And I've found in my earlier days of preaching... Uh, I was probably a little bit more harsh when it came to people I didn't agree with. But I found the the fact that you're going to love people into the church more than you're ever going to debate them into the church. And so with that in mind, I want you to be able to invite your friends, your neighbors from the community, from any church that they might already go to, and tell them to come on. They won't be offended uh, by me saying anything about their particular uh, church choice. Uh, I think you can preach the truth uh, without having to do that. And for that reason, I want it just to be uh, a welcoming place, especially this week. And so I hope that you'll invite somebody to be with us. And we're looking forward to just studying God's Word together uh, this week. Now, again, the challenge today, and I know we have some Auburn fans among us. I know that there's a game on this afternoon. And for all four or five of you Auburn fans here, we're going to let you out as soon as possible, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're going to try to get, move you along, okay, and uh, keep you awake at the same time. So, now I know you already see the title up on the screen, but I want to ask you this question as we begin our study. Who is your number one enemy? Most of the time we might say Satan. You know, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we think about him being our number one enemy, and he is. In a lot of ways. But I tell you, your worst enemy is yourself. And the challenge we all have with that is the fact that we come into this world pretty selfish. And as we grow up, it doesn't change a whole lot, does it? Now think about babies. We'll start with that beginning stage. When babies come into the world, do they want your attention at any point in time? Absolutely. Those of you who have babies or grandbabies, you know how that is. They will let you know in the middle of the night if they're hungry or if they're dirty and need changing or whatever the case is. And that's the thing is when when you're born into this world, you want everybody's undivided attention. It's all about you. It's not about anybody else. And again, when we grow up, sometimes that doesn't change. Let me ask you this for proof of that. When you see a group picture with you in it, Who's the first person you try to find in the picture? We all want to know what we look like in a picture, right? We always go to, where am I? And that's the tendency that we have is we like to know about us. And we like to be the center of attention. 
And uh, that's just kind of the human nature element of, of our lives. We really like to be uh, the one talked about or the one in the front of uh, everybody. We, we want everything to be about us. And let me tell you this, it affects the church because we, we bring that baggage into the church of our selfishness and many times it causes problems. Uh, I read this several years ago from a Christian magazine. Among a thousand church attenders that were surveyed, they were asked, why does the church exist? Out of those thousand people who were asked, why does the church exist, 89% surveyed said that they wanted a church to meet their needs and the needs of their family. That's what they thought the church existed for, was to meet their needs and the needs of their family. Well, I know in one way we think that that's the case, that, that a church ought to be about you know, helping me and my family go to heaven. In one way that's true. But if we look at it from that standpoint, a lot of times we will shop churches until we find one that caters to what we want, rather than changing our lives to meet what God wants among His church. And so that's the challenge that we all have. And again, building on what we've already looked at this morning is the fact that uh, we've noticed as we looked in class that we, we are expected to do things. We can't just sit around and just kind of go through life without really paying attention to what God wants us to do. We also notice the fact that we ought to concentrate about being about Jesus and being like Him and representing Him in this world. But the main thing that's going to help us to do both of those things is to get self out of the way. Again, we're our worst enemies many times when it comes to that matter. And so, uh, just like this case with people shopping for a church or wanting a church to meet their needs, we have that problem in the church many times is the fact that we want the church to be like we like it. And, and the older we get, the more set in our ways we get. And we don't like these new songs. We like the old songs. We don't like these new songs that they're singing. We've heard that at our church, and I'm sure you probably heard that here. But you know, that's the thing is sometimes change can be a good thing. Sometimes you can connect to the next generation with certain things. It doesn't have to be like we like it all the time. So we face some difficult challenges. And this afternoon, we're going to talk about the subject, it's not about me. It's got to be all about Jesus. And so let's talk about that first challenge. First challenge that we find that Jesus talks about here in Luke chapter 9 is the challenge of denying self, saying no to myself. Now here in Luke chapter 9, you find that Jesus is giving conditions for discipleship. If any man's going to follow, follow after me, this is what it's, his life is going to look like. This is what it's going to be like. And he tells us there, if you will come after me, you have to first of all deny yourself Secondly, take up your cross daily and follow me. He goes on to say, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And so here Jesus is talking about the fact that, you know, we have to deny self. And I'll tell you, I don't like that. And you probably don't either. Because I really like me and I like to do what I want to do. And you do too, whether you want to admit it or not. We all like to do what we like to do right? This afternoon, after the service is over, you're going to go home and do whatever it is that you like to do. Now, nothing wrong with that, but it, it, it tends to be our focus in life is what do I want to do next? What do I want to do this afternoon? What do I want to do tonight? Uh, what, I, what do I want to do with my life? Young people, you start thinking about what you want to grow up and be as far as your work and family and all that. We start thinking that way, and it's hard for us to deny self as we think that. And so to deny what we naturally want to do is that challenge. And that's what Jesus says, if you're going to follow after me, that's one of the first things you got to do is say no to yourself. Well, does that mean that I have to be miserable and sad and, and bothered all the time? No, it just simply means that we have to deny the fleshly desires, the things that we want to do to please us rather than please God. And we have to make sure that we do what pleases God rather than what pleases us. And even in Christianity, we understand that self can become the main focus. You know, again, it can be about my spiritual growth or how my kids are doing in, my, you know, in our classes here or whatever it is. It can be about us. Or it can be, uh, this is one of those lines that we get every now and then, and I'm sure you do too. 
I was sick for three weeks and nobody checked on me. Nobody even called. They didn't call. Nobody. And it's almost like preachers and elders have some sort of radar system that somehow or another we can go around the community and know when somebody's sick without a call or with anybody telling us. I was in the hospital for a week. Nobody came to see me. Nobody told us you were in the hospital. You know, and, and so there are a lot of things like that, that that come back is nobody checked on me. Nobody called me. While we need to check on people, we need to call people, we need to be interested in everybody, sometimes we're flawed and we don't get to do that. But it, we can't be so selfish about, I'm going to get mad and I'm going to leave this church because you didn't check on me or you didn't call me. We ought to be bigger people than that. And so... When it comes to, to wanting our way in church, sometimes that causes division. You know, I would say 95% of church problems come through wanting your way versus anything doctrinal. It's all a matter of opinion, more so than it is about what the Bible teaches on the subject. Uh, what color carpet they put. I've heard of churches splitting over the color carpet they chose for their building. Isn't that crazy? But that's how selfishness creeps in and, and hurts us. And so that's why we've got to remove self. If you look at Luke chapter 12, you've got the guy there that had a great crop. You remember him? His crop was so great, he didn't know what to do with it all. So what does he decide to do? I'm going to tear down my barns, I'm going to build greater barns, and there I'll bestow my goods. If you go through Luke chapter 12, and, and try this sometime, underline every time this guy talks about himself in that section. Where I'm going to bestow my goods, my crops, what am I going to do? It's all about him and, and all that he had accumulated. And by the way, who blessed him with those crops? Who gave him those blessings and, and had those barns filled? It was God's blessing on him. He never acknowledged that it was God. It was all about him. This is my stuff. This is what I work for. And so we can't be selfish when it comes to the church. We can't be selfish when it comes to our possessions because everything belongs to God, folks. Everything you own right now, you really don't own. You are, you're a steward of those things. We brought nothing into this world, and you can finish it, right? And it's certain we can carry nothing out. And so we don't need to get caught up in things or our way when it comes to matters of opinion or any of these other things. And I think what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians really helps us a lot. So if you want to open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, listen to what he has to say about what ought to happen to us when we become Christians, when we become followers of Jesus. Notice here in verse 14 of chapter 5. Here he says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, not if that one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. See that in verse 15, if you underline that, if you underline your Bible or highlight it, notice what he says, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so here he tells us that if you're a Christian, that there's, there's a transformation that ought to take place in our lives that says that we no longer live for ourselves, we always live for Him. So the whole thing here is, it's all about Him, it's not about me. And that's what we have to keep in mind. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us. We have now given ourselves over to Him uh, in our obedience to the gospel, and therefore, it's not about us any longer. And so the challenge of denying self is the first challenge. The second challenge is the challenge of having the mind of Christ. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what kind of mind did He have? You know, what were His thoughts? What, what were his ways like we talked about this morning? Well, he tells us there in the context of Philippians 2 that his mindset was there about others, not about himself. He says in verse 3, beginning, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. 
Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And then verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What kind of mind does it take to lay down your life for somebody else? That's the big question when it comes to having the mind of Jesus. You see, it, he tells us, don't let anything be done from selfish ambition, but think about others more than you do yourself. Well, that's a challenge, isn't it? To have the mind of Christ, to think about somebody else more than you think about yourself. That's not easy to do. Again, I like me. I'm, I'm one of my favorite people on the face of the earth, right? And you are too. You're your favorite person in a lot of ways because, again, you do those things that make you happy. And so for me to deny myself and put others before me, that's not a natural act that I'm going to do when I get up every day. It's something that I'm going to have to learn to do and learn to practice. And for us to do that, we always have to be thinking about what Jesus did when he was here. He was always about others, not about himself. You know, he went without food in order to take care of other people. He went without sleep and rest. And there were so many times where Jesus could have easily said, I, I, I got to take a break, I, I'm out of here, I, I can't hold up any longer physically. But he kept on going because he was so interested in other people. And folks, when we get out of ourselves and we get into other people, a lot of our problems start to disappear. Because a lot of our problems or the woe is me problems. Well, I don't have this. Well, I didn't get to do this. Or, uh, you know, nobody asked me to do this. Nobody invited me to this. You know, if we start thinking about self and, and where we are and the problems we face, you know, we, we, we end up in bad spots a lot of times. Matter of fact, most counselors will tell you the thing to do, one of the first things to do if you're depressed, if you're having some struggles is to get out and do something for somebody else. Because that helps you not focus on all your problems. When you start pouring into other people, all of a sudden your problems start to disappear. Now they might not go all you know, away and disappear all of a sudden, but it does help when we get out of self and we start thinking about others. And that's what Jesus did. That was his mind. He was others-minded. And that's the challenge for us is to have that same mindset, to, to be about others, to always think about others before ourselves. And, uh, and I tell you, it's something that we got to pray about, something that we got to work about in our daily lives when we deal with other people, and it's very difficult for us to do that. And the main thing that should help us is this. As, as Paul says this in Galatians 2 and verse 20, it's really the theme or the answer to, to self-denial. He says these words, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I still live. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. The life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Brad died on October 3rd, 1984. On a Wednesday night when he walked down the aisle. And John Rice baptized him in, in a baptistry at the 25th Noble Street Church building. That's when Brad Adcock died and where Jesus ought to be living. Okay? And whatever date your baptism was, that was the date that you said, it's all about him, it's not about me. Now what we have is a power struggle that takes place many times. And it's kind of like a, a television show sometimes that you see. You ever seen somebody driving down the road and all of a sudden somebody hops up in the window and they reach in and they grab the wheel and they're fighting for control of that car? You ever seen one like that? And what, what's the car doing? It's going right down the lane, smooth, straight. It's not going... No, it's everywhere, isn't it? It's all over the place. Why? Because you've got two people fighting for control of that vehicle. And it's going to be like this until one of them gives up. Well, that's what your life many times looks like. It's all over the place because you're trying to take control of your life while Jesus is trying to control your life. 
And a lot of times it's us making a mess out of things. If we just let him have it, we'd be so much better off. And so, you know, sometimes what we want to do is we want to treat God like our co-pilot. You ever seen those tags? My next door neighbor when I was growing up, he had a big old long white car. It's probably as long as this auditorium, you know. It, and, and it had a tag on the front, and it said, God is my co-pilot. I thought, man, that's great. Well, I need a tag like that on my car when I start driving. Well, I started going to church, and I heard a preacher get up one time, and he said, I've seen a tag or a bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. And I'm like, yeah, my neighbor had one of those, you know. And he said, we ought to tear that off the car right away. And I'm like, why? He said, if God's your co-pilot, you better change seats. And I thought, well, that makes complete sense. When we treat God like our co-pilot, what do we do? We turn it over to Him after we make a mess of things. We want Him to smooth things out, and after He gets it all fixed, give us control back. Right? It doesn't work that way. It's got to be about Him and not about us. We need to relinquish control, let Him control our lives, and not try to make a mess of it of ourselves by being selfish and trying to do those things which we would like to do rather than what he wants us to do. Now, what I want you to think about, if we had the mind that, that Jesus wants us to have, the mind of Christ, if we're going to be a disciple of his and have that self-denial attitude, then that'll help us be a disciple of his. Let me ask you this. What would this church look like if everybody was all about everybody else? What would it look like? And we would be falling all over each other trying to serve and help and do. What would this community look like if this church here in this area were to be all about others out here? All about helping them. All about sacrificing your time and your energy and even your money to help somebody else out there. Folks, that's when we start making an impact on our community. That's when our churches are unified and we have such love for one another it's like Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my, di my disciples, if you have love one for another. And I always have found that statement interesting. Because Jesus didn't say, By this will all men know that you are my disciples, because you have the right doctrine. Never said that. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you are faithful in attendance to worship. All that's part of it. But by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that means we've got to get out of ourselves and get into each other and get into our community and do the same thing. And that will make a huge difference. Big challenge for us to do, but I want to challenge you to do that today. And what a difference that will make in your life, how much happier you're going to be. You just don't even realize what a great joy it is to be about others and not about yourself. And so this afternoon... As you think about your soul, that's one area that you do need to be about yourself, is to, to make sure that your life is right with God. And after it is, then that's when you free yourself from being all about you and it's all about Him. So today, if you're ready to give your life to Him, we'd love to see you do that by obedience to the gospel, having that faith in Christ to, to move you to change your life and repentance of sins. Make that confession and be baptized because you're being obedient to what He has commanded you to do. Maybe that you are a Christian and you're just not living the life that's selfless. It's all about you and it needs to be all about Him. And you're ready to come back and give Him control. We'd love to pray with you for that as well. So if there's any need that we can help you with, we ask that you come right now as we stand and sing.